Well, hello, my friends. It's Gregory here with Old Europe Antique Home Furnishings, and it's time for another episode of Antique Acquisitions. Now, as you can imagine, people have been using shelves since the beginning of time. In fact, our Paleolithic nomadic ancestors probably encountered niches and ledges and crevices in their rock dwellings, which were perfect for storing their stone and bone tools and implements. Those were the beginnings of what we would think of as a shelf. And the shelf, of course, evolved into what we would know as a bookcase. So today, what I want to do is take a look at the history of the bookcase and take a really close look at this massive Victorian era bookcase that you see in the background behind me. I've had it in many of the episodes of Antique Acquisitions in the past, so we'll take a closer look at that. Let's get to it. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and take a little closer look at this bookcase. Now you can see we have some excellent carving here. And the other thing that you'll notice is the lion with the ring in its mouth motif. Now that motif has been used since antiquity to denote strength, courage, and majesty. And I think it also gives us a little bit of a clue to uh, where this piece might have been made because I tend usually to associate that motif in furniture with uh, Le Pays Bas, which are the low countries in Europe. That would be the Netherlands and Belgium. And if we go over here, let's take a little bit closer look here at... Uh, at the dovetail. Now the interesting thing about this is there's only actually two dovetails in the front of that and uh, we can see there is somewhere on the drawer slide because this rail on the side, typically, I know it's used still in furniture throughout the ages, but that was quite common in the 17th century. But the dovetails, actually, let's talk about those for just a second. Dovetails began to be used in, in furniture making in Europe uh, in about the middle of the 17th century, so the 16, 1600s. And it typically tended to, to start out with one or two dovetails, and they were larger. And then over time, you progressed to the smaller, tighter dovetails, particularly after the Industrial Revolution in the 1830s and 40s, because that's when you started seeing machine-made dovetails, and they, they were more numerous, they were smaller, and they were tighter. And there is a particular type of dovetail that uh, you may have seen that's used only in American furniture, I believe. It's the rounded dovetails. But uh, anyway, that's not what we're dealing with here. And um, based on that, I mean, it's, it definitely appears to be uh, 19th century to me. Let's see if we can make our way around to the back side and take a look at uh, the chamfers. But first, I found this box that I had set up here. And it's uh, got a an authentic bicorn hat in it. Kind of interesting. Looks like it was well used. So let's go around and take a look at the back. Ah, oh, guten Tag. Und ja, richtig. We will discuss the back side of that bookcase in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to revisit the idea of the history of the bookcase and shelves. Now, you may recall that 
before the intro sequence, we discussed the idea that our Paleolithic ancestors would have encountered niches and crevices in their rock dwellings or caves that would have been excellent for storing their stone implements. But as we move forward in time to the Neolithic period, their descendants had really started to settle down. They were producing more permanent dwellings and they were cultivating the land to produce crops and those crops would have needed to be stored and a great way to store crops of course is on shelves so that's kind of an intro into what i want to talk about now you may have noticed that i changed locations from the shop where the bookcase is at and i did that because i want to read to you a little bit now about the history of the bookcase and I thought this might be a more appropriate setting. I've got my German chair here. I mean, I'm sorry, Austrian chair here and my German pipe. Now, this pipe is 214 years old, according to the plate here. And a minute ago, when I uh, was inhaling through the pipe, I could actually still smell the aroma from the tobacco that they would have used. I mean, who knows when the last time somebody smoked this pipe was, but that was an interesting sensation. So now, Let's take a look at the history of the bookcase. Baskets and pottery held grain in communal granaries, or they sometimes sat on shelves or nooks in the wattle and daub or stone walls of individual dwellings. In mud brick homes of ancient Mesopotamia, wooden shelves likely held cooking implements and other household items, while the municipal archival rooms of Elba and Nippur housed clay tablets. The community's records of account were on these clay tablets. They were on shelves or in wooden pigeonholes. Shelves have evolved along with the walls that supported them. Thus, to some degree, the history of shelving is bound to the history of architecture. One particular species of shelf has received special historiographic attention. There exists enough scholarship on the history of the bookshelf to fill, well, an entire bookshelf. Before books, there were scrolls. The ancient Romans, like the Sumerians, stored their extensive scroll collections in cells or pigeonholes or on pegmata. These were platforms composed of planks of wood that were typically sold along with the house. Pegmata were thus among the first built-ins or shelves as features. As the scroll evolved into the bound codex in the final centuries of the Roman Empire, libraries more frequently stored written matter in wooden cabinets called armoria, arranged along the walls of a room. And throughout the Middle Ages, as scribes laboriously copied books by hand in scripteria, they continued to secure their precious and expensive tomes in armoria, whose cabinet doors mediated access. With the rise of monastic and university libraries, however, books were displayed more openly for access by patrons and as a statement of an institution's cultural capital. Yet the materials still needed to be kept secure. Few storage strategies are as blatantly symbolic and so stereotypically medieval as that of the chained library. Books with chains affixed to their covers were tethered to iron rods and laid upon lecterns, which often had shelves above and or below the reading surface where patrons could store additional text, thus freeing up workspace. Historian Robert Darnton writes of a library scene at the University of Leiden portrayed on a print dated 1610. It shows the books, heavy folio volumes, chained and high shelves jutting out from the walls in sequence, determined by the rubrics of classical bibliography, which are Juris Consulti, Medici, and Historici, and so on. Students are scattered about the room, reading the books on counters built at shoulder level below the shelves. They read standing up, protected against the cold by thick cloaks and hats. One foot perched on a rail to ease the pressure on their bodies. Reading cannot have been comfortable in the age of classical humanism. The shackling began in the 15th century and continued in some libraries through the late 18th century. The Hereford Cathedral Library in the United Kingdom is among the few institutions that have retained their chains to this day. With everything lying flat and with stacking made difficult because of the unwieldy chains and the occasional ornamental book cover, shelves had limited capacity. The inefficiencies of horizontal book storage eventually led to the consideration of a different orientation. Wonder what that orientation might be. Those chained books were turned upright, uh -huh. often with their fore 
edges facing out on shelves above the library lecterns. Eventually, as books became more plentiful, the chains came off and the lectern metamorphized into the book press, which was a bookcase that could be closed. With the book newly emancipated, so too was the reader, free to take books away from the stacks to a nearby stool, bench, lectern, or table. The mobility of the book afforded the user a sense of control over its use. A more comfortable engagement with it, thanks also to the arrival of a smaller print formats, and perhaps greater intellectual liberty as well. The interior walls of many European libraries of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries were lined with wooden bookshelves, some heavily ornamented, some offering attached desks or lecterns. The metal book stack reigned supreme in institutions for much of the late 19th and 20th centuries. Still, in that period, the book storage industry did evolve with the advent of rolling and sliding shelves. All right, now let's take a break and go back and look at the back side of that giant bookcase at the shop. Okay, we're around here on the back side. I just want to take a quick look at these chamfers. And by chamfers, I mean the beveled edges or chamfered edges of these thin, flat boards between the vertical support columns. And those beveled or chamfered edges allow the boards to fit into grooves on the sides of each of those vertical columns. But those are probably machine chamfers, I would think. In fact, by the time you get to the very late 1800s, the chamfering has basically gone away completely and given way to flat backs on these bookcases and other cabinets. I'll show you an image now of some hand chamfering. Okay, this is the hand chamfering that I wanted you to take a look at. Clearly done by hand. That's the top of a uh, German cabinet. There's an 18th century bench in the background there all told yeah this is uh probably a european piece it doesn't look as much like uh the late 1800s i mean it, it could very well could be anywhere from 1850 to 1900 i would say it was made in the northwest part of europe in the low countries region it's absolutely extraordinary in size and it's very impressive when you're looking at it. I've got the top off right now. It's about to leave in the next few days, but very massive bookcase. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what type of home or organization would have been able to afford such a majestic piece of furniture, because I'm sure at the time this was made that it was very expensive. All right, well, let's get back to my own library now and finish up with the history of the bookcase. Since the days of Mesopotamia, the homes of nobility have been stocked with tables, scrolls, and codices, and these elites, private libraries, formed the foundations of many historically significant institutional collections in the ancient world. Yet it wasn't until after the spread of mechanical reproduction, when printed matter was made more accessible and affordable, that the private libraries became a more egalitarian possibility. Particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, new library forums, new capacities for mass printing, and new reading habits, along with the expansion of public education, transformed the place of books in Westerners' everyday lives. Meanwhile, the emergence of new consumer goods and practices of consumption and collection gave rise to what Walter Benjamin described as the overstuffed bourgeois interior. People needed cases, receptacles, and shelves, not only to store, but also to display their ever-expanding assemblages of books and baubles and gadgets, which together cultivated the appearance of respectability and plenitude. The history of the bookshelf thus expands here into something bigger, as the books are intershelved with other accessories and artifacts. While the Victorians had their glassed-in display cases and barrister bookcases, interwar homeowners more frequently opted for built-in shelving. The books on the family bookshelf and personal papers in the secretary desk were joined by new media, mass circulation, periodicals, rec record players, telephones, radios, and eventually TV sets. As media theorist Lynn Spiegel explains, manufacturers, in an attempt to facilitate the integration of these new potentially intimidating and unsightly objects into the home, 
often camouflage their contraptions in cabinets styled to match popular domestic decor, which meant a lot of hideous Chippendale-style TV sets. Manufacturers and consumers adopted similar approaches when the hi-fi system appeared in the 1950s and 1960s, creating attractive consoles and built-in storage to mask the machines and their wires. And that, my friends, brings us up to the present day. So as you can see, the bookcase as we know it has evolved significantly over time in quite logical steps. All right, my friends, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little something about history and antiques. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you'll be alerted when new videos become available. We'll see you next time.